I'm just going to read Isaiah 6, 8 before we start. It says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Let's just have prayer and then we'll start our study. Father, we just thank you for the beautiful day you gave us today. Thank you that we got to get outside and enjoy your creation. I just thank you for these women and the fellowship that we've been able to have, Lord, and just that you protected us today. I just pray that our hearts would be ready to receive your word now and that you would be glorified in the next hour or so, Lord. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So now that we talked about who we are, being in Christ, what should we be doing now? Now that you've placed your faith in him and you've been placed in the body of Christ, what now? Well, just like God has a will for you to be saved, he now has a will for how you should live. Turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 12. This verse we're going to read is concerned with the believer in time. It tells us that what happens after salvation is important. So it starts with therefore. And the therefore is going to kick us back to verse 5. So let's start in verse 5, and I'm going to read down through verse 11. So it says, Let this mind be in you. And that word for mind is phrono. And it means to have understanding, to think, your mindset. So let this mindset be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. That's the kenosis. That's the emptying of his deity. Taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, which is a highly humiliating way to die. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then we come to our therefore. So therefore, that you have this mindset of being a servant like Christ did and all that he did on the cross for you, and that one day you're going to answer to him and bow down to him. So therefore, my beloved... As you've always obeyed, these Philippians are people who were obeying, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So Paul's hearing of their obedience, that they're, they're following what he taught them. And then he says to them, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This word for work out is katergadzom ahi. You know, the kata on the front intensifies the word ergazomai, which means to work or accomplish or literally to work down to the end point to an exact definite conclusion, bring to a decisive finality and end conclusion. So he's intensifying that, that you need to work this out. This is a present tense verb with a durative action, which means it's a continuing action that we need to do over and over and over we are always to be giving energy and thought towards the significance to our salvation in phase two. And look here, it says to work out your, not, your salvation, not to work for your salvation. So we have three phases in salvation, which are on your paper. So phase one, we have been delivered from the penalty of sin. Phase two, we've been delivered from the power of sin. And phase three, we've been delivered from the we will be delivered from the presence of sin. Now, phase one and phase three are really things that we don't have a part of. God, in his grace, did those for us, right? We accepted his gift of salvation. 
He delivered us from the penalty of sin. All what he did on the cross is what delivered us from the penalty of sin. And in phase three, when we meet him, we're going to be delivered from the presence of sin. He's going to deliver us from that. But in phase two, he's done the work of delivering us from the power of sin. But it's our choice. We're involved in this being delivered from the power of sin because we have a choice. We have a choice in how we're going to respond to what God did for us by delivering us from the power of sin, by rendering the old man useless. So we're involved in what God has given us in grace in phase two for our deliverance from the power of sin. And I gave you a quote from Wearsby where he says, to know God personally is salvation, to know him increasingly is sanctification, and to know him perfectly is glorification. And isn't that such an exciting thought? One day we're going to be perfectly glorified with him. All right, so God has already provided you with all you need to walk in godliness. Remember, the moment of salvation, he gave you that bank account of of blessings. He's changed you, made you a new creation from within. And he's, he's giving you everything that you need to walk in godliness. But do you have a choice on how you're going to respond to that? He gives us free will. We can choose to get to know him and walk in obedience. Or we can choose to walk in our flesh. That decision is up to us. And as we grow in our knowledge of truth, making decisive decisions will become easier. That's his goal for us, that we can have his mind, his thoughts, so that when decision time comes, we know what decisions to make. We know what choices to choose that are going to bring glory to him. So back to our verse here. This says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this fear and trembling, it does not mean with dread. What it means is with concern lest you fail. So what to be feared is missing out on what God has for you. And why do we miss out? Because of our own human rationalization. We try to explain or justify behavior or or, or an attitude with logical reasons, right? Like, well, I did that because so-and-so did that. Or I just feel like this is good. Or I know, but that's just how I am, right? We try to make excuses for when we make bad choices. And so God is saying here to work out with fear and trembling. You don't want to miss out on the best that he has for you. So figure out what you have in salvation. Figure out what God has provided for you in phase two salvation to help you grow in him and mature in your walk. So I put on your papers the (coughs) Strong's definition for with fear and trembling. And it says, used to describe the anxiety of one who distrusts his ability completely to meet all requirements, but religiously does his utmost to fulfill his duty. When I read that, I was like, well, no kidding. What anxiety we would have if it was in our own strength that we had to meet all these requirements of walking in truth, right? But go to verse 13. I'm sorry, Philippians. Philippians 2. It says, so he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. This is a different word used here for work. It's the word energio. So this is where we get our word energy from. So it's God himself who is the one who is energizing you. He is continuously working in us. It says to will, that's to choose or to desire his good pleasure. And he is continuously working in us to do, to perform his good pleasure. And isn't that a relief that from the strong definition of what fear and trembling is, it's not something we have to do. This is just something we need to be in fellowship and let the Lord do through us. 
And this is where that battle comes in in your mind, too. You're in a battle because you have the enemy who's fighting for you to, to walk in the flesh, and then you have the Holy Spirit who is constantly working in you to choose and to desire his good pleasure and to perform his good pleasure. He's our divine energizer. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't slow down. He doesn't quit. And that's why believers, when they choose to walk in sin, there's no peace. There's no joy. There's just constant conflict because you are in a battle. And you're not letting God do the work through you that he wants to do. Before you can start walking with the Lord, though, it's, it's having a willing heart. Having a willing heart always proceeds doing. Turn with me to John. I think you can find your finger. So John chapter 7, and we're going to look at verse 17. And here's Christ talking. I think he's at the temple talking here. So John chapter 7 verse 17 says this. If anyone wills, that word wills is the word teleo, and it means to desire. So if anyone desires to do his will... He shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. So here's Christ telling them, if you have a heart, if you have a desire to obey God, he's going to reveal his truth to you. He's not going to withhold that for you. Um, let's just turn back to Second Chronicles 16, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with. It's such a great verse. It shows us. God's desire for us. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole world, earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Remember, the heart is your mind. It's whose mind is loyal to God. It's whose mind desires to know him and walk in obedience to him. And he's looking. He's looking for those whose heart is like that so he can show himself strong on their behalf. Isn't that a wonderful truth? To know that when you desire God and you choose to walk in his obedience, he's going to show himself strong on your behalf. He's going to work for you to do his will. And remember, his will, his plan for you, is better than anything you could ever imagine. It's the best. It's the best thing that's for you. So what do we do? We justify, make excuses, and bring in humanistic, earthly reasoning when we make choices. Instead of going to him in prayer, instead of digging into his word, and instead of seeking his will and resting in him, we try to do it in our own strength, in our own fleshly thoughts. We need to be choosing every day to make a conscious effort to orient to God's grace provision for us in our life, in real time, right now. That's what phase two salvation is. It's right now what God wants to do for you and how he wants you to walk. On the way back, let's look at John chapter 10, uh, verse 10. And we're going to see that in life, we have two choices. We're going to read what these two choices are. Here's Jesus speaking again. And he says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Well, who's the thief? It's our enemy. So that's choice number one. We can choose to follow the enemy, live on an earthly level, walk in our flesh, and what does he have to offer us? He's going to steal... What's he going to steal? We're going to read in a minute. And to kill and destroy our life. That's what his MO is. That's what he wants to do. But Christ says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He's not, he, he's talking about eternal life here, but he's talking about more because you're not going to have a more abundant eternal life. 
you're just going to have eternal life if that is what it is. He's talking about right now. He's saying, I want to give you abundant life right now. Right now in your life. <coughs> that word for abundant, abundantly, is perisos. It's an adjective derived from peri, which means all around or excess, and properly all around, more than, beyond what is anticipated, exceeding <coughs> expectation, more abundant, and going past the expected limit. That is what Christ has to offer you. And when you walk in Christ, that's the kind of life he wants to give you, going past what you would ever expect or anticipate. That's the abundant life he wants to give you. So there's your two choices. Write that down, and when you're contemplating, whether walking in your flesh or walking in the spirit, Go back there and see what your two masters have to offer you. So let's go back to Philippians, chapter 2. So God is not trying to break our will, but he's energizing us. He's working in us to be a decisive person when it comes to his will. What God has intended for you is the best thing that could ever happen to you. And you do not want to miss out on that. So you need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You need to be walking in fellowship so that God can do the job he wants to do of energizing you to do his will. And to make choices that align with his will for you. God gave us volition and he left us our life choices up to us. We have to decide our life choices. We can't just sit around and be like, well, I'm just going to wait for the Lord. He didn't design us that way. He designed us to make choices. We decide what we're going to do with our life. We decide where we're going to serve the Lord. We decide if we're going to get married or who I'm going to marry or where I'm going to go to school. Am I going to go to school? All these life choices are left up to us. We have to make them. And what we should want is for our will to line up with his will, for his choices for us. Let's turn now to Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. And I know these are also very familiar verses, but these two verses are essential to the believer's decision-making process. Let's go through these. I'm just going to read them, and then we're going to go back and talk about them. So it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So let's go back to verse 1. Paul starts out with saying, I beseech you. This word for beseech is like, it's begging. He's, I'm urging you. And this is one of the most tender expressions in the Bible. Paul uses this word, parakaleo, about 50 times in his epistles. And I just love Paul. When you read Paul, he just, you just see his heart. He just wanted people to know and experience the Lord the way he had. He wanted people to grow and just have such a deep relationship with the Lord and that's why he's just begging them there. But that's what it is. He's just begging them to do this. This is not an exhortation, not a command. And it's probably because Paul realized that our attitude in presenting ourselves is just as crucial as our presenting ourselves. Think of the Pharisees. They followed the law to a T, right? And what did Jesus say to them? Your heart is so far from me. Your attitude is wrong. You're whitewashed tombs. You're vipers. And that's what God wants. He wants our attitude to be an attitude that wants to present ourselves to him. So he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies. This word mercies is oik termos. And it means compassion or pity. But it, it's visceral compassions, meaning it, it's relating to the deep inward feelings rather than to the intellect. And it's used of the deep feelings that God has for us all. 
and powerfully shows and shares in those following him. I want to experience those mercies in my life. I want to have God show his mercy all the in, in power to me in his mercies. So he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present. This word present is peristemi. And it means stand close beside or ready to present. And it, it, it means to present yourself like a like a soldier would would show up for duty and say to his commanding officer, Here I am, what do you have for me today? What do you have for me to do? And this is an aorist tense. Again, which means that you present yourself here, and you have to present yourself here, and you have to present yourself here. And this presenting is in your mind. It's, it's a mindset. It's an attitude that you no longer are going to be a servant, a slave to the old sin nature, because now you are God's servant. And as you grow in your knowledge of Christ, so should your desire to present yourself to him. And this is a choice that we have to make daily, maybe sometimes multiple times a day. We can only serve one master. You are either spiritual or carnal, walking in fellowship or not walking in fellowship. There is no in-between in serving God. So he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies all you are, present all that you are, a living sacrifice as opposed to the Old Testament dead sacrifices. And he says, holy, that means set apart. You present yourself different from the world. Acceptable, which means well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, it's your spiritual service. And that ser- the word for service is latria, and it's the highest form of worship possible. This is what God is asking us. To do This is the type of attitude and mindset he wants us to have, right? So we have our our to-do lists every day, and this would be saying, all right, God, here's what I have on my my agenda today, but what would you have for me to do? What do you want for me today? Because I want your will in my life, not my own. And that's the sort of attitude he's asking for us. And then he goes down into verse 2. And he's going to tell us what not to do. And then he's going to tell us what to do. And he says, And do not be conformed to this world. The word for world is the word aeon. And it means age, space of time, like a time period. Turn with me to Ephesians 2, and we're going to get another view of this word being used. So Ephesians 2, 2. Actually, I'm going to read verse 1 also. And he made alive, and you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in in which you once walked according to the course, that's our word there, age, so according to the time period of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So this word world, that's what it means. The, the, the time period, we would describe it with the word uh, zeitgeist. And I put that in your paper. And a zeit, zeitgeist is the defining spirit or mood of a particular period of history as shown by the ideas and beliefs of the time. And that's what he's saying He's saying once, in Ephesians, he's saying that's, that's how you were, walked. You, you walked all caught up in the ideas and the beliefs of the time. And when we go back to Romans, he's saying don't be conformed to the zeitgeist. Don't be conformed to the ideas and the beliefs of the time. And, and every time period has, has something, something perverting that they want you to, to go along with. Um, yeah, I would even say now the zeitgeist of the time is, is doing good, right? Isn't that a good push to, to, to pay it forward, to do good? We're going to save this and we're going to save that and we're not going to save anything. So don't get caught up in that. He says don't get caught up with whatever ideas and beliefs are going around at that time. 
So he says, do not be conformed to this world. The word for conformed is suske meritso, and it means assuming a similar outward form or expression by following the same pattern, model, or mold. So it's acting outwardly what you are not inwardly. Because remember, inwardly, we're new creation. That's who we are. That's We have new identities. We have new position in Christ. And that's who we are on the inside. And he's saying, don't act on the outside what you are not on the inside. Let's go to the 2 Corinthians 11.14. And I want to look at a similar word. But it's a little bit different. And you're going to see why. So, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verse 14. And it says, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. And that's our word, transforms. And it's similar, but it's, it has a different prefix. It's meta schematizo. So the meta intensifies the uh, schematiz, and it's where we get our word scre- uh, scheme. So Satan is the opposite. Satan is acting on the outward, what he is not on the inward. What does he do? He pretends to be something he is not. He puts on an act. He's masquerading around as an angel of light, when really inside... He is just morally evil, wicked. So he's acting on the outward, what he's not on the inward. And back in Romans, God's saying, you don't don't do that. You are different on the inside, and your outside should match that. And then he goes on to say how to do that. He says, but be transformed. The word for transformed is metamorpho. And the meta on this one means to change after being with. And the morpho means changing form and keeping with inner reality. And I just love this. So how do we change? We change after being with what? With, with God. We change after being in God's word. That should change us so that our outward reality starts to match our inward reality. In, in Mark 17, 2, in a... I mean, Mark 9, 2 and Matthew 17, 2, it's the same word metamorpho um, when Jesus transfigures himself to the disciples and he gives them a glimpse of what he's really like inside. And so that's what Paul is telling us to do, to be transformed, this metamorpho. And how do we do that? By the renewing of your mind. The word for renewing is anachinosis. And it comes for, from anakono, which means to make new. It's a renewal, a renovation, a complete change for the better. And this being transformed happens in your mind. It's your mentality. It's your heart. It's the deepest resource of who you are. And it's getting the doctrine into your mind. But the doctrine is not the end. It's what you do with the doctrine. So what I want to do now is there are many different Greek words to depict knowing, but we're going to look at three of them tonight. And the first word we're going to look at is the Greek word I do. It's E-I-D-O, and it's, it's seeing that becomes knowing. It's, it's having facts. So let's look at, we're going to look at two verses to get an idea of what this is. So let's look at Matthew Chapter 6, verse 8. So here we have Jesus speaking. And he says, Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows. He has the facts. The thing of the things you have need of before you ask him. 
He has the facts. He knows what you need. Now go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 18. I'm like, that's not right. Okay. It says, The eyes, which is your mind, of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the expectation or the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So Paul's saying, I want you to know the facts of what you what your hope is, what you're expecting. From your calling. What have we been called to? We've been called to salvation. Christ put out the call. Here's my gift of salvation. And we responded. That's our calling. And he wants us to know, to have the facts about what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. He wants us to, he's telling you, I want you to know the facts about what you have. So that's the word I do. The next word we're going to look at is genosco. Well, this is my favorite one. So this word means to know experientially in a meaningful way. So let's look at James chapter 1, verse 3. So he says, I'm going to actually read verse 2. It says, my brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, experiencing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Doesn't that give it a different meaning? To, to, to experience something so that you have an experiential knowledge of it? Now look over at verse 20, I mean chapter 2, verse 20. And he says, but do you want to experience, O oh foolish man, what faith without works is, that faith without works is dead? Imagine if nobody in the body wanted to serve and do the good works that God has prepared for them. What would our body look like? It's not something I want to experience. Okay, let's go back to Philippians chapter 3. In verse 10. And he says, That I may know, that I may experience him in the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And we should all want to know that. And now look over in chapter 4, verse 5. He says, Let your gentleness be known, be experienced to all men. The Lord is at hand. Just to drive it home, let's turn to Genesis chapter 4. This is a Hebrew word, but it has the same meaning. And it says, Now Adam experienced Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Gives it a very deep meaning, right? It's an experiential knowledge. He had the facts about her, and then he got to experience her. So this is believing. This is Having the facts about God, you, you have the I do facts, and then you turn them into Genosco knowledge, because now you experienced those facts, the facts that you know about God. And the last one we're going to look at is epinosis, and it's knowledge gained by first-hand relationship. So go back to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 17, we're going to back up to verse 17. Okay. 
Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. This is firsthand knowledge. This is a deep understanding knowledge. This knowledge is in the deepest resources. It's part of you now. It's knowledge gained by experiencing God, and now you just you have this firsthand relationship with him. And then let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, 12. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. I know, I can talk faster than your brain process. I get that. It says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know, this is Janosko, I experience in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. I shall epinosis just as I am epinosis. Now God has complete knowledge of us, and we won't have complete knowledge of him, but we will have a deeper knowledge of him. It's it's. It can be thought of like this, this epinosis knowledge. It's, it's like the protein of the mind. It's, it's the residual doctrine in our mentality. So we, we take in a lot of facts, and this is what sticks. Like John 3.16. Epinosis that, because it's everybody could probably recite that and explain what it means. And that's, that's in our inner man. That's... It's part of us. That's what this epinosis knowledge is. So, we need the I do facts about God. But then we need to take the I do facts, and we need to genosco those facts where we're believing the facts, and we know, and we're transferring those facts into experience. And then when we do that, then that's when it can be part become part of our epinosis knowledge. So, Back to, well, I guess we don't have to go back to Romans yet. So, the transformation is of our mind comes from the renewing, which is getting doctrine into your mind and believing it. A lot of us have the facts. We can give the right answer. We, we know the verses and we can even recall them. It's, it's the believing part that we struggle with. And so I thought I would give a few examples of having I do facts, but not genoscoing them, not believing them. Um, some, so I'm, I'm kind of talking about, we, we don't believe these promises of God. So what happens is we can get into a pattern of sin, where we're walking in a pattern of sin. We know it's a behavior God has told us not to do. But we do it anyway. As so, well, I had some obvious examples. Like in Ephesians 5.18, it says not to, to get drunk. And drunkenness is wastefulness. That's an obvious one, right? Uh, stealing. In 1 Corinthians 6.9, it says stealing is unrighteous. That's an obvious one. Sexual immorality. In Galatians 5.19, it's a work of the flesh. We, we know these. We would agree if we... Very obvious if somebody was walking in those sin patterns and we saw it. Those are the obvious ones. But there's other ones that, you know, we rationalize and make excuses when we are in a pattern of practicing these sins. But we make excuses for us because they're not really bad. They're not like those sins, right? (laughs) So the first one I came up with was patience. Was patience. Patience. I want to look at Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 3. That's not right. Oh, wait. Oh, yes, that's right. Okay. Okay. 
I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, I beg you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all holiness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another, endeavoring to keep, to guard the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Oh, I have these on your papers, I think, don't I? Did I get these two guys now? Okay. Okay, I didn't, I'm sorry. So, patience. God wants us to be patient. He wants us to keep the bond of peace. How about Galatians 5.22 where it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. 1 Corinthians 13.4 says, Love is patient and kind. If you are constantly losing your patience over and over and over, and it's a pattern, that's a sin pattern. Because it means God, you're not believing what God has told you here. Love is patient. If you are going to exhibit love by walking in the Spirit, then you are going to be patient. If you're walking in the Spirit, you're going to produce patience. That's what God says in Galatians and in, in 1 Corinthians. So that's one. Another one was anger. Let's turn to James chapter 1. And read verse, I'm going to read verses 19 and 20. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If you are a person who is prone to anger, and we all do these sins, I'm talking about a sin pattern, when it's something you are continually doing. If you're a person prone to anger, then you're not believing God that it's, it's unrighteous to do that. It doesn't produce the righteousness of God. You're not walking in fellowship. So if you're not walking in fellowship, what are you walking in? The flesh. There's, there's no middle road. There's no excuse. I know I did that, but that's not how God sees it. You're either completely spiritual or completely carnal. How about thankfulness? Are you a person that's grumbly and complains and sees everything negative? What does 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says? say? It says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do you not believe him that that's his will for you? If you're a, a person who complains and grumbles and is never thankful for anything? How about worry? Let's look at Philippians well, I can just read it. We know this one. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Or 1 Peter 5, 7. He says, Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. If you're a person who is constantly anxious and worrying, then you're not believing these verses. You're not believing that God can give you his peace. He's already given it to you. You just need to walk in it. And when you walk in the spirit, he's gonna, you're going to experience that peace. And he's going to guard your hearts and your minds. And do you not trust him with situations? Or situation, these things that you think you have to worry about? You just can give them to him. You just ball them up and you say, "Those are you deal with these. I can't. I'm just going to worry about it. So I just wanted to talk about these sin patterns. And it, it's we all get caught up in them. We're all guilty. But we don't have to be. We need to understand that we can have all the facts about God. And we need to have those facts. That's where it starts, gaining these facts. But we need to be trusting him. And turning those facts into experience so that we can be experiencing and having a relationship with God. He's not a God of legalism. He's a God of relationship. He wants a relationship with us. And how we do that is by trusting him and claiming and, and, and believing his promises and resting in them. So we can go back to Romans 12 now. 
So when, we sh when issues arise, we'll get there. Okay. So the key to Romans 12, 1 and 2 is this renewal process. It's this mental process of taking in doctrine and incorporating it into your thinking, transforming your mind into the mind of Christ. We want to get this, this, these truths and experience them and get them so that they are part of us. They're in our deepest resources so that when we start to lose our patience or get angry or we start to grumble and complain or worry, that we have those verses and we're like, I believe that verse. I know that verse. I believe that verse, Lord. That's what this renewal process is. When issues arise, we know how to respond to them. Our outward expression matches what we have or what we are inside because of the truth in our mentality. And what will the result be? It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This word for prove is dakimatsu, and it means to test, to show something is acceptable, real, or approved. It's, it's to put to the test to reveal what is good and genuine. Dakimatsu does not focus on proving that something is wrong or bad. If something is sin, we don't need to try to prove if it's right. We know it's wrong. So Dakimatsu doesn't focus on proving if something is wrong or bad, but it, it's, it's proving on whether it is approved, genuine, or good. It's kind of like if you have a decision on two schools, which one you're going to go to. That's what this Dakimatsu is. It's, it's the working out of that process, of figuring out which thing. And the thing, it doesn't say it in our Bibles, but in the Greek it implies that what thing, and the thing is the will of God. That's what you're trying to prove. Is this the will of God? And you're trying to, you're, you're testing it in view of approval. That's what that Dakimotsu is. And in making decisions in real life circumstances, the thing that is God's will will show itself to be these things. It'll show itself to be good, which is, means ultimately beneficial. It'll prove itself acceptable. It means well-pleasing to both you and God. God's not going to stick you in a place that's going to make you miserable. He loves you, and he wants the best for you. And we prove what, you're going to prove what is perfect. It's, it's what's having reached its end, complete perfect. It means you've fully thought this out, and it, it can't get any better. This is the best decision for your, your life. I have an example of that. So, when Daryl and I got married, I thought we'd be moving. He went to school to be a pilot. And so, he never wanted to be a commercial pilot. He went to school when 9-11 happened, the whole industry changed, and he didn't really want that lifestyle anyway. But he thought he would be a pilot, either a bush pilot or a 9-to-5 pilot, which is a real thing you can fly for, like, FedEx or UPS. But in order to do that, you have to have hours. So he thought, we're going to move down south, and I'm going to work as a flight instructor until I get enough hours to get a really good job. I was like, okay. Well, that didn't happen, and at the same time, a recession happened. So one of the things you take off your to-do list when a recession happens is getting your pilot's license, because it's very expensive and it's time-consuming. And the thing about being a flight instructor is you don't actually get paid unless you're actually with a student. It doesn't matter if you sit down there all day. There's no money unless you were instructing. And so... He got another job still down at the Groton Airport at this little airport that anybody who is anybody coming into the casino, I think Michelle Obama threw, flew through this airport when he was there, would fly through this place. The, the man who owned it was extremely wealthy, and he had his own little airport. He also had his own little airplanes. And he had pilots, and his pilots were kind of getting older, and his pilot was really a drunk. And so Daryl worked there, and he would fuel the airplanes and stuff, and he really rubbed shoulders and got to know a lot of these people and stuff. And the man really liked Daryl, and he trusted Daryl. He'd give him these odd jobs for him. 
And he liked him, and so he finally said, hey, I, I'd really like you to start getting your hours up and, and fly for me. Because this guy, he was wealthy, and sometimes he'd like to fly down to the islands. And so Daryl thought, oh, okay, this is, this is a way I'm going to build up my hours. And he would be on call, which means if the guy decided he's going down the day before Christmas, that he's going, Daryl would have to be ready to go. And he thought about it, he's like, well... Yeah, if I could do this for two hour, two years and get up hours, then I could get another job. And so we started praying about it. And the reality is of what Daryl would be flying this guy to do was not good. He's flying him down to the islands to party and be with women. And he would expect his pilots to participate in this with him. And so... At first glance, it seemed like a really great opportunity. It's close to home. It's, it'll only have to be a few years before he gets his hours up. But when we really started praying about it and thinking about it, we went through this process without even really realizing it. And it wouldn't be ultimately beneficial. It wouldn't be good for Daryl to be leaving his family, to take this man to do these things, and to be with him and being expected to participate in it. Definitely was not well pleasing to me or Daryl or to God. And when we thought about it, this this was not the best. If God wanted him flying, God could come up with a way, a better plan, something better for him that would get him in the air that didn't cost him any money. And so he not only turned down the job, he ended up quitting there, and then he actually moved to a job that he loved. It's his favorite job at the Avcrab, fi- fixing Black Hawk airplanes or helicopters and stuff. And not only did he not leave us for periods of time, God gave him this job that now every other week was a three-day weekend. So he actually got more time with us. And this is an example of just this proving process. When we're faced with decisions, we need to work through make a list of pros and cons and work through and just ask ourselves, is this the best? Can, can, can it get any better than this? And that's how we go about making choices. Is this God's will? And we work through it. Is this beneficial for us? Okay. Is it beneficial to our walk with the Lord? Okay. Is it well-pleasing? Is it something I'm going to like? Is it something that's going to be well-pleasing to God? And is there something better on the table? And this is the process that, that we go through in this renewing of our mind, improving when we make decisions, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I put this quote by Kenneth Wust on your papers. I thought he did a really good job of kind of summing up Romans 12, 1 and 2. And it says, And stop assuming an outward expression that does not come from within you and is not representative of what you are in your inner being, but is patterned after this age. But change your outward expression to one that comes from within and is representative of your inner being by the renewing of your mind, resulting in your putting to the test what is the will of God, the good and well-pleasing and complete will, and having found that it meets specification Placing your approval upon it. So God has given us the responsibility to make choices, <coughs> but he hasn't left us without the resources to make them. And the promise to guide us towards his will if we choose to let him. And this is all part of the working out of our salvation. We're, we're choosing to trust God with our lives. So what has God provided for us to be successful in our walk? Well, ultimately, he's provided us with his grace. God's sovereign grace supplies everything necessary for you to succeed in his plan, his will. And he (coughs) wants you to succeed. So I looked up in the Noah Dictionary, Noah's Webster 1828 Dictionary, his definition of grace Now we all know grace. We'll say, oh, it's God's unmerited favor. But really, it's so much more than that. And I like the Noah Webster's Dictionary's definition. It says, the free, unmerited love and favor of God 
the spring and the source of all the benefits men receive from him. That's what God's grace is. It's him extending his best, the best that we can have to us. And all the benefits that come with walking in obedience to him. See, he's already given us all this stuff, but we don't experience it unless we're walking in fellowship. And that's when he extends his grace. And that's when he he just lavishes all these blessings upon us is when we're walking in obedience. That's when we get to experience him. That's when we get to know him. Turn with me, if you would, to Titus chapter 2. And we're just going to look at verses 11 through 14. God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope in the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. You see, the salvation he's talking about is your phase two salvation. He wants to save you from the power of sin. He already has saved you from the power of sin. He just wants you to choose in that, to walk in that salvation he's provided for you. And what does that do when we walk in fellowship with him? We're allowing the Holy Spirit to do our work his work, and he's teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, to live soberly and righteously and godly. And what does that do? It makes us look forward to his glorious appearing. How exciting is that? He's coming back for us. He's going to appear. One day we are going to stand face to face with our Savior. And why did he give himself for us? That he might redeem us from every flawless deed and purify for himself his own special people that's his desire that we will be walk pure before him and that we'd be zealous for good works and we're going to look at that tomorrow about gifts utilizing our gifts for good works so what are some of the things god has given to us to be successful well turn with me to romans chapter 8 We're going to look at verse 26 and 27. So the first thing he's given us is intercessors. Intercessors. In Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart's mind knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And how comforting is that to know when we don't know what to pray? And how often is that? You're in a situation or you have an issue with somebody, maybe it's your kids or your spouse or a friend, and we just don't know what to pray. Lord, what do I pray about? How do I pray about this? What? I don't know. And he says, I do. You have the willingness to pray and the forethought to do it. You just give that to me. I know what to say. And he advocates for us. He he intercedes for us. And then look at Romans 8.34. He also gave us Jesus Christ as an intercessor. Who is it who condemns? Sorry, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So we have these advocates with the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ who are making intercession for us. They're communicating properly what needs to be communicated to the Father. What else has he given us to be successful? The Holy Spirit. 
something new to this age. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us to energize us and to point us towards God's will and to encourage us to do that. What else has he given us? He's given us his word. Without his word, we would not know him. This is how he revealed himself to us. You want to know who God is? You need to read his revelation to you. We would know nothing about God if he hadn't given us his word. That's how we become successful in our walk with him. What else has he given us? Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. And this has to do with gifts. So let's first look at verse 7. It says, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Which means, when Christ gave us gifts, he also gave us the grace to accomplish those gifts. The means to accomplish them. And then in verse 11 it says, And he himself, this is Christ himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets. Those are who wrote our Bible, right? These prophets aren't really people who are predicting the future. They're just people who were preaching the truth at the time. They're the ones who gave us the scriptures, the New Testament that we have. And some evangelists, the word for evangelist, it means missionary. And some pastor teachers. These are some things that God has given us so we can be successful in our walk. And the evangelists or the missionaries are thought of as those who are interested in birth of somebody getting saved, right? The, the, the start of salvation. And the pastor teachers are interested in the growth. So the birth of the body and the growth of the body. And what for? Look at verse 12. It says, He gave these pastor teachers to us for the equipping, which means the perfecting, the preparing of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, the church, till when we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So he gave us these pastor teachers to assist us in our growth. They're the ones who take the time to study and break it down and make it more clear, more simple, so that you can have understanding. They can't make you successful in your walk, but they assist you by providing you with teaching on the scriptures on how to walk. So that's another way that God thing that God has given us to be successful. And two things that he's given us that we're going to look at tomorrow are spiritual gifts and the local body. And the local body is vital to your success in your Christian walk. It's vital. It's a vital part of what God has given us. And we're going to look a little more at that tomorrow. So all success in our walk with God is by his grace It's what he supplies us with to help us be successful. So what does success before God mean, or what does it look like? Success before God is knowing and doing God's will. Success before God is being conformed to the image of his son and having the mind of Christ. Success before God is is valuing what happened at the cross the way the Father values it. How much thought do you give to the cross? Without the cross, you would have nothing. It's at the cross that you have everything that you have in Christ. How much thought do you give to that? The Father values it very highly. If you read through the scriptures, he talks about it. And he wants you to value it the way he values it. He values it so much that he put his son at his right hand and placed everything under his feet. He values it so much that he placed you there with Christ. Success in God's eyes looks a lot different than success of the world, doesn't it? So let's... I think I put this on your paper, 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Okay. It's 
says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been, you have been saved, given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. See, God has already provided for us. We, we've already escaped the corruption. The old man is dead. It's only when we bring him back up, we allow him to have a voice in our head, that we fall back into the flesh, we fall back into the old man. God has already made you victor- victorious. We possess all that we need to be successful in our Christian walk. God has provided it all. There's no reason for us to fail, to be unsuccessful, unless we choose to. Unless we choose to be unsuccessful. So that's all I have for tonight. Tomorrow, we're going to look at the ministries of the Holy Spirit, the purpose of the church, the spiritual battle we're in, and walking by the Spirit. It's going to be a short lesson. All right, I'll close. Unless anybody has any questions or thoughts or comments, Ruth? (laughs) Nothing. Okay, I'll close in here. Father, we thank you so much for all you've given us. We thank you that you have freed us from the power of sin, Lord, and that you have given us everything we need to walk successful before you. Lord, I pray that it would be our desire to know you deeper, to take the facts that we know about you and to believe them, Lord, that we would have a desire to walk in fellowship with you, Lord, and that we would trust in your promises and we would heed them and we would grow by believing them and resting in them, Lord. Pray that they would become part of our thinking and that our relationship with you would be deep and meaningful, Lord, and that we would have a desire to present ourselves to you every day. I pray for our body, Lord, that we as a body would have a desire to grow and that we would be using the gifts that you've given us and walking in truth and encouraging each other and pointing each other towards you, Lord. And I just pray for the rest of our night, Lord, that our talk would be around you and our thoughts would be on you. And we will bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.